Hi, I'm Lance Roger Axt. I am the producing director of Pocket Universe Productions, and you can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Instagram, you can find us on Twitter or X or whatever the heck Elon is calling it this week, and Blue Sky under Pocket Plot. That's all one word, Pocket Plot. And our website is www.pocketuniverseproductions.com. But right now, you're watching and listening to two geeks talking. And I am one of the geeks. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. He is the producing director of Pocket Universe Productions. He is, of course, yes. a very talented individual in his own right. And I this am? is going to be the, well, I, I think you are, but. Wow. Okay. I, I think we're going to have a wonderful conversation today. We're talking about audio dramas. We're talking about everything that goes along the lines of Pocket Universe Productions, because we are joined by the ever-talented Lance Axt. How are you doing today? I am doing absolutely marvelous. It's unusual to have uh, an interview for a uh, podcast at five in the evening on a on a Saturday, but then I have to remind myself of that one guy in Kenya who wanted to have an interview with me and said, can we do it at 1 a.m. your time? Because that's what works best for me. I'd be asleep. Uh, <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Awesome. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. I am bringing the word of audio drama with as many funny voices as I can get away with. I am, as you mentioned, the producing director of Pocket Universe Productions. Mine is an audio drama production company. That was originally called Audio Comics back in 2010. I co-founded the company with my friend Bill Dufries, who uh, tragically passed away in 2020. Bill was the voice of Bob the Builder. He was also the voice of Spider-Man for the BBC, uh, as well as one of the actors in uh, the BBC's adaptation of American Werewolf in London. And the two of us worked on a variety of projects over the years, I'm sure a lot of which were going to touch on including uh starstruck that was our first show titanium rain and the perhapanauts which led us to a short-term collaboration with audible on the full cast adaptations of the x files with the original cast members as well as lock and key before the tv series happened and most recently before the pandemic, we worked on the first season of EC Comics Presents The Vault of Horror, which is the sister title to Tales from the Crypt. And then after the, well, during the pandemic, uh, I worked on several titles for Scholastic Audio, the publishers of Harry Potter. And with my new partner in crime, Jack Bowman, we have a number of things in development, the first of which came to fruition last year, that being London After Midnight. And London After Midnight, which I'm sure we're going to talk about quite a bit here, is our adaptation of the lost silent film starring Lon Chaney, which is considered one of the holy grails of the silent film world, for reasons of which you can ask me about later on. And Jack and I are also working on two other uh, very exciting projects, which we uh, plan to record, record one in 2024 fourth quarter for a release in 25 uh the other one first quarter 2025 uh for release that summer um and that's what i got for you so far but hopefully that's enough so so you're, you're a little busy it's safe to say that's a bit busy yeah that's a bit busy i'm getting sleep though i am getting sleep that's something somebody once asked me do you ever sleep i just like <laughs> You're funny. As my mother says, you know, sleep when you're dead. You got to enjoy life while you can. What's the misconception about the audio drama genres that you deal with that people who don't oh, follow it misunderstand? God, we're going to be here for a couple of hours. Okay. Um, let's start with the simplest misconception. And that is, I guess the best way to put it would be an old phrase that best describes this period of, of radio, which is, Look, there's the detective, and he has a smoking gun in his right hand. It's the old tropes that are connected to the golden age of radio. 
And that's something I've been trying to clear away for years. And at the point where I started to clear away, as I'm, as I'm wiping my brow here, as the dust was clearing in regard to that misconception, that's when you start seeing all of these podcast audio dramas appear uh, here, there, and everywhere. All of them, or most of them, science fiction based or horror based. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I mean, that's you know what I'm working on right now. But the biggest problem that we've been having is finding ways to monetize it finding ways to get people away from the mindset that it has to be free, that the talent has to be free. When it was announced many years ago that Bill and I, along with um, several collaborators, Fred Greenhalgh, Dirk Maggs, that we were all working on the X-Files, there was a lot of positive reinforcement from people. Oh my God, you're doing the X-Files. This is going to be so great for the medium. And then we had some blowback as well that, oh, great, you're making this harder and harder for us hobbyists. So, and not in the best possible terms. So trying to find ways around the hobbyist mentality, at least for me, has been a real struggle. It continues to be a struggle. You know, it's, it's funny, my partner in crime, Jack Bowman, once said that if uh, Steve Jobs was still alive, because Steve Jobs managed to figure out a lot of what was wrong with podcasting and fix it for Apple. If he was still alive, he would have figured out what's wrong with, with fiction podcasting and figured that out as well. We're still in a bit of a quandary. You know, it's hard to find advertisers who want to jump on board because it costs so much to do compared to, say, a single, simple um single narrator, uh, true crime piece, or everybody wants the true crime pieces now, or your business to business, you know, who's your guest this week, two person podcast where there's going to be an episode every single week. So, you know, finding ways to make this into, at least in the United States, an ongoing day job, that's been my biggest, yeah. my biggest hurdle. And that's continues to be a hurdle 10 years on. I'm with you 100%. When it comes to saying, hey, the, you know, we're providing a service more than just, say, in my case, an interview show or your case, an audio drama. It's mm -hmm. along the lines of, well, you should be paying the guests to come on the show. And, and to a certain extent, I can understand that mindset, but it's not a viable business option to stay in business because 15 yeah. years of doing this, I have to start providing services in order to, you know, help the masses because it's what I like doing as well. Saying that this is a viable business, this is a viable option to make money and still enjoy the craft of what you're doing with audio dramas is definitely something that's needed. Yeah, because what we're also doing is not just providing a service, but we're trying to provide a service at the best possible level. You know, there's a lot of, I, I don't mean to kick the can, so to speak, or, or kick people not when they're down, but just get people's work. But there's a lot of, there's some good work out there and there's some bad work out there. And unfortunately, a lot of people hear the bad work and think that this is what audio drama is. When it really has to be, I am saying that it needs to be up to this level and it has to be up to this level, not it should be this level. You know, you have to set a very high bar and a lot of people are just somewhat worried about doing that for some reason that if they do so they're going to be kicked out of whatever click that they found themselves in with other hobbyists that just seems to be what i've seen i could be completely off base i don't think i am but that's what i've seen for the most part you know these are the problems i've been trying to struggle through yeah let's talk about Obviously, some of your amazing projects that you're currently working on here. So Pocket Universe Productions leans towards independent endeavors like London After Midnight and, of course, Shaman's Tears. You know, how do these different approaches shape your creative process? That's a good question. Well, it really, I think, depends on the material that I'm going to be jumping into. Let's talk about London After Midnight for a second. What is London After Midnight? London After Midnight is the holy grail of silent films. It is a lost silent film and has been since 1965 that starred Lon Chaney as the man in the beaver hat, which is a character that's become somewhat iconic in the world of horror uh, to this day. Um, the film that he did in 1927, which grossed, I think, some like a million dollars. I could be wrong on that, but it grossed a hell of a lot of money for 1927. 
Uh, the last known copy of it was destroyed in the MGM fire, vault fire in 1965. So no one has seen this piece for years. But as of last year, the work went into the public domain and the script was still available. So it was hard to find, but there's copies floating around in the ether also known as the internet. And Jack and I found it and Jack suggested, why don't we turn London After Midnight into an audio drama? Now, this is where we're talking about creative process. Here is a real challenge, taking a silent film or something written as a silent film and turning it into an audio drama where the original material had no sound. And here you've got sound <laughs> as, as the, as the principal mechanism for, uh, for getting your information. That is one way of saying what you're talk, talking about, what the creative process is. It's, it's not something that you really talk about. I feel it's something that you do. It's instinctual being able to say, you know, how does this affect your creative process? Truly, truth be told, I don't know. But a long time ago, I decided not to really dwell on it as much as just go with the flow. Here we had a situation with the script available, but no surviving footage, a little bit of surviving footage of stills, but no actual surviving footage of the, of the film. How do you go about creating this? Well, you go about creating it through mood. You go about creating uh, an audio drama by taking what you, know, what you get out of the original script that corresponds with what you think the original film was about and being able to take that mood and being able to take it and put it into uh, into an audio format if that makes them if it makes any sense it's like you're creating a a film script and you're you're taking a film script you're putting it into a format as if you were trying to create you know something that is understanding the tone of of what that film tries to become but but making sure that you're staying true to the original material at all yeah. times which i think we accomplished yeah we put together the production in about three months. My uh, collaborator, uh, Kendon Hall, this was also a, a great thing to have, to have a collaborator on board for writing it. Uh, and that's someone that Jack introduced me to a long time ago. Uh, Kendon lives in London. He's a musician, uh, actor, filmmaker. It was so nice to have someone to bounce ideas off of because I've been known to have writer's block going on sometimes for months. Uh, I've had writer's block on a graphic novel I've been writing for close to a year now. <laughs> being able to have someone to work with and say, okay, I'm stuck here. And then you pass it over to him and he says, oh, I know what to do. And then he'll go on for a couple, you know, a couple pages, 10 pages or so, and then send it back to me. Oh, great. Now this hurdle is cleared and I've got a clear path to move forward. I know what needs to go here and it's, you know, it needs to go here. And it just becomes instinctual after a while. You, you don't try to question the creative process. You just go with it. But okay. having a, another writer to work with was uh, was extremely helpful. Shaman's Tears is going to be something completely different in the fact that Shaman's Tears is based on a comic book series by Mike Grell, who's the man responsible for the Warlord for DC Comics. Uh, John Sable Freelance, uh, he wrote uh, and drew the Tarzan comic strip for a, year, a couple of years. He was one of the few, I think, Americans allowed to work on a James Bond comic book. And that's going to be a completely different situation as well, but that's because the cast, the most of the crew the musicians are all going to be native Americans hmm. because this is a comic book about a native American superhero. So this is going to be seen through a native American lens. Every, everybody involved for the sake of authenticity and the sake of respect is going to be a native American actor. So, or musician or native American artist in the studio. So that's going to be a different process altogether, you know, in working with these people, what that process is going to be like. I don't know. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be completely different from, say, London After Midnight, which was a very grounded piece between three people. Here's a project that's going to have about six or seven people involved. The, the project that I'm involved with right now, which we'll talk about at the very, very end, that's got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six people involved. And most likely the actor coming on board to play the title character uh, may wind up being a producer as well. So there's going to be seven, a collaborative of seven people involved. Uh, each person bringing something different to the table, uh, one on a creative level, one on a marketing level, one on a social media level. That changes the makeup of how I work and how I think. And again, I just go with it. You know, you got to adapt. But that's the good thing about collaborations. Everyone's bringing their own perspectives and their own experiences and professionalism exactly. to the projects. And I think that adds value from a, a creative standpoint. If you can work with each other and leave the egos at the door, which I'm sure you all can, yeah. it makes yeah. your project that much better. It is. And, and that's the nice thing that I've found about 
working in this medium for so long is that for the most part, there have been some, a few instances, a few situations, but for the most part, people do leave their egos out of the door because it's gonna be about the work first. It can't be about yourself. Now, crafting an immersive auditory experience is paramount to audio dramas. And I think that's what really in, gets us invested into whatever we listen to, especially like London After Midnight. And of course, yes. I'm sh- sure with Shalman's Tears as well coming up. Could you delve into the creative process behind the sound design and voice casting for London After Midnight? Voice casting for London After Midnight, that was all entirely Jack. In this case, Jack is the director. I totally respected him and his choices because I knew what he wanted. The initial role of Edward Burke was not the most difficult role to cast. Uh, In fact, I don't think there was really any difficult roles to cast. And that's because Jack had worked with so many great British actors over the course of the last 10 years that he immediately knew, okay, this person for this part, this person for this part, this person for this part. When we got Art Malik, that's because he had likewise worked with Art on a production of Murder on the Orient Express Mm. for Audible UK. And apparently the story went that uh, representatives from the estate of Agatha Christie were going to come down to Audible Studios to see Art work. Art is the was one of the villains in True Lies, and uh, he was the villain in The Living Daylights, villain in uh, True Lies. He's appeared in the uh, live action fil- films of John Carter as well as The Little Mermaid. But he's a hell of a voiceover actor, and he was able to get all of his lines done in under three hours, I think, three wow. three and a half hours. Everything done in three and three and a half hours. So by the time the folks from the Christie Estate showed up, he was already done. He's out of there. So I mean, it just consummate professionals that I've seen and heard in the United Kingdom, more so I feel than the United States. That's because audio drama is still very much a staple in everyone's diets through uh, BBC radio, you know, the archers, 50 years. So the only difficulty was the role of Sir James Hamlin. And that's because one actor was uh, scheduled to do it and then kept putting it off. Is there any way you can find someone to replace me? Okay. Now you definitely need to find someone to replace me because he wasn't able to make it literally the day before. And that's when a friend had contacted Jack to say, this actor is available. Why don't you send him the script? And this is, this is my moment of ego. I guess I, 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 I'm allowed a little bit of ego myself is the fact that the actor was sold on the script after reading the first 10 pages and he was in the next day. And that's Dan Starkey who played Strax on Doctor Who. So that's pretty amazing. Finding the right actors, that's paramount for me. Uh, I think any director would agree. Somebody once said that 90% of doing an audio drama in terms of the directing is voice acting. You've got to find the right actors. If one actor completely shoots the moon, that's fantastic, but if another one can't pull his weight it's like a rowboat that person has just put you know just drilled a hole in the bottom of the boat and now it's starting to sink so finding the right actors are is immeasurable and i that's one of the things that bill had a real problem with with a lot of actors that he was dealing with is that most actors for voiceover are trained to do commercials they're trained to do video games they're trained to do what's known as short form narration whereas bill wanted actors who could do long form narration who had more theater experience than they, and they had experience in front of a microphone, but didn't feel as though the microphone was going to eat them alive. That they felt that they could work in front of a microphone and not feel self-conscious about themselves. So finding those actors is extremely important in terms of the, uh, uh, the overall production. Then of course, finding the right person who's going to mix and master it. There's a lot of people who can do it. There's a lot of people who can't do it. You know, we've, we've heard from this person, that person, and the other person down the road, can you consider me? And then you hear their work and their work just is not up to snuff. You know, again, it comes back to setting a very high bar who can you know go past that bar. We found that the, some of the best people that we've worked with, interestingly enough, have been involved with video games because they're already in immersive environments and that's what we're trying to create with uh, audio dramas is is an immersive environment for the ears you're getting at least one half of the equation the ears over the ears and the eyes but if they know how to do the ears it makes it a lot lot easier i think that's why so many people have gravitated towards our productions is the fact that we do have quality work 
you know, we had a, um, a very high praise from Publishers Weekly a long time ago. These guys are setting the bar in terms of full cast audio dramatizations. And there's a variety of reasons for that. It's because we have the right people on board to do the mixing and mastering. We have the right actors on board. We also, not so much anymore, Bill really had this down to a science. And I'm still working on this myself. Of course, I couldn't do this with uh, Scholastics projects because of the pandemic. Couldn't have everybody in the studio. But one of the things that Bill used to do, which his mentor, Dirk Maggs, used to do, I think still does, is bring everybody together. It's called the gang method, as a former director for animation once called it. Bring everybody together in the same room and work at the same time in the same physical space, which is important because if you've got this person recording over here, this person recording over here, a trained ear is going to hear this crap. You know, if you got one person in a studio here and one person recording in his kitchen, and that's happened. I know I've had to uh, do editing on works where the voice talent lied and said, "Oh yeah, I have access to a, a, a studio," and the studio was <laughs> the studio was the, the back room of their house with uh, blankets over it, or a kitchen with absolutely no no you know soundproofing protection like what I've gotten here you're going to hear it. You're going to hear this person recorded here and this person recorded here and it takes everything out of it, you know? So having people in the same physical space or at least in the same size studios, if they've got a home studio where there's enough manipulation, so it sounds like they're in the same space, it helps immeasurably. But that's one thing that Bill used to do in terms of our productions. I saw this firsthand when we were working on EC Comics Presents The Vault of Horror because he had built a studio out of his garage he had built it in the style of BBC studios, which is a big open space with one or two microphones and everybody crowds around the microphones. It's usually a binaural mic. So it can get everybody in a uh, 360 degree space and everybody plays off of each other, you know, and you hear about this a lot in Hollywood with certain films that are put out by say DC entertainment. I remember distinctly an actor who was working, I think on Batman year one, Maybe it was Batman Year One. It was definitely a Batman project. And Brian Cranston was playing Commissioner Gordon. And the actor was bemoaning the fact that he couldn't be in the same room with Brian Cranston to do his lines with him. But that's because the agent had scheduled this time and he had to do it this time. And Brian Cranston had to do it this time. We try to avoid that as much as humanly possible. You know, If it's a situation where everybody can be in the same physical space, then that's the way we're going to do it. It just makes for a more fun experience. That's one reason why I'm very loath to work with an actor in Kansas or an actor in Seattle, an actor in Boston, whereas everybody in the same space is just going to make for a better, better experience. And the better experience is going to translate into what you hear. That was definitely the case in uh, London After Midnight. That's definitely going to be the case as much as we can do it with Shaman's Tears. Yes, I can't say the names of the actors who are involved yet. I can say that some of them are Hollywood celebs on television series. If we can get everybody in the same space at the same time, that's fantastic. I, I think it's going to be a real challenge. But at the very least, if we can get everybody in the same, you know, the same booth in the same studio, you know, that's going to be at least one half of the equation taken care of. That's awesome. I'm rambling. No, no, no. It, this is remnant, 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 man. <laughs> kind of reminds me of when you see the behind the scenes, when you saw like Robin Williams and Aladdin playing with um, the lead of, of that series. And, you know, you, you see trained actors or talented actors and just joy that they get from playing off of each other. And you see that excitement. I think you, you can hear that as well. And I think that's what really draws us that aren't in the industry into these incredible productions like your own. Yeah. Uh, The person I was talking about earlier who does the gang method, he's not directing these days uh, for uh, animation, but his name was Mark Evanier. And Mark Evanier was the director of the Garfield show. And he insisted on having everybody in the same studio at the same time because he had the best rates in Hollywood. So he was able to get Stan Freeberg and he was able to get uh, June Foray and he was able to get Frank Welker and all these great people to come into the same studio and have have fun with each other. And he said, there's a great actor I know um, lives in the Midwest. Wonderful actor. I'll never hire him. London After Midnight delves into themes beyond the typical detective narrative. Could you elaborate (laughs) on the underlying motifs explored within the series? Yeah, gothic ghost stories. Nice. I'll tell you something that the Brits know how to do better than anybody. It's a good ghost story. You hear the word ghost story, that gets people agitated, but in a good way. You know, I remember going to see... When I lived in Monterey, there was a uh, professional theater company in town, Union Equity House, and they were doing 
the woman in black. There is a stage version of the woman in black for three actors. And it scared the hell out of everybody. The last, I won't tell you what happens in the last two minutes, but that last two minutes just, oh my God. But the thing about it is it is a ghost story. And it's a ghost story where after the show is over, it does what a good ghost story is supposed to do, which is you're looking over your shoulder. You're carrying that experience with you as much as possible. And that's what we did ultimately with London After Midnight, because London After Midnight is the story of, well, it starts with a, a man who is, commits suicide in the Balfour House in the vestiges outside of London, English countryside, five years earlier. And then some very strange people wind up renting the house. One of them signs the deed as Roger Hamilton, which was the birth name of Roger Balfour before Roger Balfour eventually committed suicide. So that's where the character of the man in the beaver hat comes from. So are we dealing with the undead? Are we dealing with vampires? But there's a twist at the end as well that I came up with that everybody liked. Just because the original film, I continually say to myself, I think if people found the original film, they're going to be a little disappointed because there's been so much hype surrounding trying to find a copy of London After Midnight that if they find it, oh, that's how it ends, you know? So it's very melodramatic. And I wanted to avoid the 1920s tropes of melodrama. You know, this isn't a, a Mary Pickford piece. I came up with something that would be befitting the end of a good ghost story. And some of the reviews that we've gotten have, have stated that it worked, you know, it stayed with them. You know, that's what a good ghost story is supposed to do. So it's, it's detective story, sure, but it's also... And it's not horror. I want to make that clear. At least it's not horror for me. It's a ghost story. And in that vein, I would call it a thriller. And that's what we've, what we've crafted here. But the telling of a good story, you've still succeeded with London, London After Midnight. So I, I can't wait to, to actually get a chance to listen to it fully. First off, I haven't had a chance. You to. haven't listened to it yet? Not fully. Not fully. It is literally what I'm going to be listening to and scaring myself shitless probably um by the time i would go to bed so. well, i don't want to say scaring yourself shitless but but definitely that feeling of creepiness that comes along with with ghost stories like I, i'm thinking of the nigel Keneally pieces like the stone tape mm. um as well I, I can't remember what else nigel Keneally, the stone tape immediately comes to mind but also there was a a, a television adaptation of woman in black and you know it's it's funny how in Britain, these stories really resonate with people to the point where those particular pieces, Stone Tape and Women After Black, were presented as Christmas Day releases. I mean, Christmas Day, you're, wa you're watching a ghost story, but yeah, it's, it's very true. I, I distinctly remember just thinking about this. There was a, if you can find it on YouTube, I know there are episodes available. It's called Shadows, and it was actually a series of ghost stories written in the 70s for kids. I mean, the BBC and ITV were really pushing the boundaries of children's entertainment in the in the 1970s, but there was a show called Shadows. And what I really appreciated about Shadows is these were ghost stories meant for kids, but there is no theme music. There is no ending theme music. You have the story, the story ends, you might just hear the, the wind whistling outside and then in come the credits, no music. And I appreciated that to an extent because the music would have taken me completely out of it. Whereas no music, you just are left with the creepiness and the eeriness of the experience and you take that with you. And that's what we've tried to do with London After Midnight. Nice. You know, take that experience with you. <laughs> It also keeps yourself in your mind. You're also thinking about the episode continuously and the ending or maybe a scene or something earlier on that got your mind to stir. Right. Can you walk us through the collaboration between Pocket Universe Productions and Audio Marvels for Shaman's Tears? You know, how did the fusion of your, of your respective strengths enhance the upcoming project or will enhance the upcoming project? Well, it comes from the fact that we both are fans of the material. 
that was a very big part of it. I, I introduced Jack to this material when I thought about doing this. This, this came about because years ago, uh, Bill and I had talked with Mike Gold. And Mike Gold was the former head of First Comics back in the 1980s. And Mike really wanted to get some of the people that he had known back in the 1980s uh, indie comics boom to have, uh, have audio dramas made of their work as, as a way to push their, their material back into, the, uh, back into the ether, so to speak, or back, in, back into you know, public view. Uh, and that included, we, we talked to John Ostrander about Grim Jack. We talked to, uh, um, who else we talked to? We talked to Tim Truman about Scout. Uh, and the name Mike Grell had come up a couple of times. And initially we talked about the idea of doing John Sable, but finding out later that uh, John Sable is not available because um, Mike doesn't have an agent who's, who's pushing it for television right now. But the other title that came up was called Shaman's Tears. And Shaman's Tears also reminded me of a wonderful experience I had back in 2006 at what was called the National Audio Theater Festivals in West Plains, Missouri, or as I call it, the middle of the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's four hours away from Memphis. It's four hours away from anywhere. I think it's biggest thing going for it is that it was the home of Porter Wagner, uh, but it was also the home of the Comics Price Guide, strangely enough, Gemstone Publishing. Uh, Russ Cochran lived there. So it was the home, home of, of the, uh, the Bible for the comics industry in the middle of nowhere, quite honestly, in the hottest place on the face of the freaking earth. In 2006, we had an influx of native American writers and actors and musicians coming to do audio plays with us. And it was one of the most fun experiences I've had at any conference, any festival. It, it's, it was up there for me with San Diego Comic-Con, to be perfect honest, and just in terms of my endorphin levels. And I wanted to find something fun to do with one of the company's native voices at the Autry, which is... Uh, one of the premier theater companies devoted to Native American work in Burbank, California. And I've known Randy Reinholtz for a number of years. I'm an acquaintance of his wife as well, Jean Bruce Scott, who was on a TV show called Airwolf back in the day, as well as the original Magnum P.I. The two geniuses, and I I don't say that lightly, I say that very, very strongly, geniuses behind Native voices. And I wanted to find something really fun that we could all work on together. And that's when Mike Rell's Shaman's Tears came of age. Now, what drew Jack to the piece, I can't speak for him, but he's mentioned this a couple of times in conference calls, so it's safe for me to bring this up, is the fact that Jack has an Irish mother. Here we have a situation where you have a lead character in the form of Joshua Brand grappling with his own even greater sense of identity because his father is indigenous while his mother is white and Irish. Where is my place in society? That is something that drew Jack to it, the project as well, beyond just the script being really, really fun. And our first call with Randy, we've said this to each other a couple of times. I'm going to make this public for the first time. Anytime you have a call with Randy Reinholz, is a good day. Randy is a truly upstanding person, the kind of person that you want to have in your corner. He's someone who we're just thrilled to have on this project because of the people that he's brought to us who would like to see this done and see this done well. That's another situation like what we're talking about earlier of bringing together groups of people and how is that going to change your creative experience? Well, it all depends on what those people are bringing, not just in terms of, well, I can bring this person here or I can bring this amount of money or I can bring this to the table, but they're also bringing positive energy. They got to bring positive energy. Otherwise, it's going to be just a slog to, to get through. And I've, I've been through those experiences before, and I, I've sworn to myself never to ever do that again. And certainly not something that I want to do here with Shaman's Tears. My goal is to do a production that is worthy of everyone's time. And something that also that Mike Grell, who has had some not so great experiences uh, in the past, the Sable TV series comes to mind, give Mike a really, really great experience that he can take with him wherever he goes next in his creative journeys and say, these guys did it right. And that's something that we wanted Bill and I, and now Jack and I want to bring to everybody who comes to work with us. That was the case with Elaine Lee on Starstruck. That was the case with the creators of Titanium Rain. 
when we worked on a project, when we still work on a project, and it's a situation where we're going to be in the studio, we invite the playwright, uh, comic book writer, playwright, or however you want to categorize that particular person, we invite that person to come to the recording sessions. We invite that person to meet and have a little say in the casting, even though the final say is up to the director, have a little say in the casting as well, at least be able to hear who's going to be playing my parts, you know, who's going to be playing the characters I created. We always give the uh, creators first crack at writing it. If they don't want to write it, fine, I'll do it. Or somebody who's connected to the director will take care of it. And that person will work in tandem with the writer to make sure that the writer's vision is not being subjugated in any way. That is something that we bring to the creative process is trying to create a sense of community if you will, because I'm theater trained. You know, Bill was theater trained as well. Jack Jack spent a lot of years in the theater. In the UK, we all come from a place where collaboration is the key element to any project being successful, and that's keeping the ego out, out the door, but bringing something that is going to be beneficial to the production and positive energy or this person is really hot to do this. Oh, by the way, take a listen to his material. Oh my God, that's fantastic. Let's bring him in. Trying to be empathetic, you know, because that's the key to being a, an artist, I feel. Being a successful artist, I'm not talking about su success in terms of money. I'm talking success in terms of corny as it's going to sound, what's in here. And that's the fact that we are empathetic people and trying to bring some level of empathy to the project. It shows authenticity. And that's the main thing that yeah. I think, I think a lot of people, when it comes to certain projects, you look at the professional side of things, but you look, the monetary side kind of creeps into that aspect. But yeah. if you have passion and empathy for the source material, it's, it's a balance. It's a really careful balance that you got to keep. Once you get that team together and you know, everyone's strengths and weaknesses, you, you find that balance with each other and you can make something amazing. Mm -hmm. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? My theater days. Yeah. One of the best experiences I've ever had in a theatrical environment was in my salad days at San Francisco State University. I've talked about this a lot in the past. And it was the first time that I have been in a theatrical experience or part of a theatrical experience, part of a collaboration, part of a community where I really got to express myself creatively. And that was on an adaptation of Moby Dick. Um, we called it a response to Moby Dick in ways that I will not go into here because it was so personal to process for all of us. It's, it's again, not something that you can talk about. It's something that you do. But what I will say is that was really my first and best exposure to classical language and what language can do to you. I do say do to you, not for you, but do to you internally, emotionally, artistically. And I think working on something like that gave me a greater appreciation of Shakespeare later on. I have nothing but disdain for my high school years. I have nothing but disdain for my high school history teachers. I have nothing but disdain for my high school math teachers and most importantly i have nothing but disdain for my high school english teachers i'm mostly disdain for high school for a variety of reasons but the main reason i have disdain for the latter is because they are the ones who wrecked shakespeare for me in my junior year and somewhat in my sophomore year as well and shakespeare is something to be not just appreciated, not just admired, but it is a theatrical experience when done well that takes you outside of your body. That's the way I've always felt about the man. When you pare it down, pare down his works, Hamlet, McBee, I won't say the full name because I don't want to jinx anything, or King Lear, or the works that are turned into slideshows or film strips from the 1950s and you have to take a test on them. You've completely destroyed the joy of language for generations to come. It just took me so many years to get away from what was done in those years to being able to appreciate the man and to be able to appreciate the work. And that's why you know my favorite place to go in the world is still the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. It's not Paris. It's not Australia. Although I haven't been to Aust Paris in Australia. I'd like to go someday. But it's the Oregon Shakespeare Festival because that's where 
language lives. That's that's my feeling about it. We have um, I'm Canadian, so we have Stratford, Ontario, and those many yeah. amazing plays. And how close are you to Stratford? Three, four hours, maybe. I'm in okay. the so I'm in Windsor, Ontario, so I'm like south. I'm 25 minutes away from the uh, Canadian border, but there's Bard on the Beach, which I have not seen yet in uh, in Vancouver. I'm, I'm very interested, I'm very intrigued how that's going to go over. But they take it as seriously as as oh, the OSF yeah. does. I mean, uh, yeah, but there's there's quite a few Shakespeare festivals that I still have yet to see. Utah, Idaho. Um, there's it's one of the Berkshires. I mean, there's there's more Shakespeare festivals in Oregon and, uh, and New York. Really great Shakespeare festival. A really great Shakespeare play. Mm-hmm that's that's something that gets me excited right. i mean i have great respect i wish i had seen this production years ago there was a production done at the osf of titus andronicus which is almost impossible to stage but it's the bloodiest play in shakespeare's entire canon i think second only to Macbeth, um or the scottish play if you want to call it um be more technical uh and they set it in the vietnam war how perfect mm-hmm. how freaking perfect is that i would have been something to see Jeez. I got to get to more plays. <laughs> I, I know. Like... Me too. Me too. Um, I'm going to ask my introspective questions here. And then do you have any upcoming projects that you're excited about starting or working on that we can know about? Yes. Okay. The official announcement was made on Wednesday and it's making its way throughout the circles connected to this particular writer but in fourth quarter of this year uh, i will be producing and acting in an adaptation of i can't believe i'm saying this i i honestly can't believe i'm saying this because this is a process that's gone back or a project a project that's gone back project process a little bit of a a little bit of column b going back to 2019 when the idea was first broached john carter warlord of mars by edgar rice burroughs and our goal is, and you'll find out more about the creative team as the months go by, because we're going to be also making a major announcement at San Diego Comic-Con at Edgar Rice Burroughs' panel. Our goal is to make the definitive John Carter audio drama that other people down the road, if they want to make a John Carter audio drama as well, they're going to have to beat us. They're going to have to beat what we did because we've got the right people on board. This, this is a project where there's six or seven people involved. We have an art director on board. We have our social media manager. We have our showrunner who's also, who's worked on uh, projects uh, for this guy named George Lucas. We have a great director on board. This is going to be an incredible experience. And fascinatingly enough, I have gotten, when I, I released this information on LinkedIn, as well as Facebook, I don't think I have gotten this many responses saying, can I be in it? Will you record this at my studio? Just because of the weight that comes with the name John Carter and the name Edgar Rice Burroughs. So I'm very excited that we're going to be progressing on this uh, later this year. And if you want to know more about that, you would go to johncarterrises.com. Again, johncarterrises.com. Sign up for updates. Uh, we'll be releasing information on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, probably closer to weekly. We have a lot of exciting news to share, little bits here, little bits there, leading up to San Diego and the big reveal of who will play John Carter in our production. So, awesome. That's amazing. I love that. I know. Exciting. We're going to Mars. <laughs> Mars are bust. Mars are bust. Yeah. Or I should say Barsoom is, is probably the... the correct terminology here so bar sumer bus that sounds better actually there you go, go. That, that is that going to be on a t-shirt are we going to see that uh bar sumer oh, bust love to see that on a t-shirt we're talking about t-shirts as well so there you go um, <laughs> all right last bring three. it up with the estate let's, let's see what happens I, I gotta say this as well the estate has been absolutely fantastic right. to work with you know we we really lucked out we really lucked out there's been it, i've been involved in projects on occasion where the estate has, has been nothing short of roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. But no, these guys have been wonderful. We worked what, out. What was the, so, di- what was the difference from say this estate versus others? Is it just, was it the right time for this project to come about? Was it just something that they just wanted to see done right? Like, I think a little bit of everything. 
uh, the, the timing was right. They loved the idea of an audio drama. They loved the idea of bringing this character that has been around for so many years to new audiences. The caliber of this team uh, certainly was was a big help in itself. Yeah, yeah. I'm really, I'm really excited. I think people are going to be very impressed with this. San Diego can't come soon enough then. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was yeah. that for you? Oh, boy, that's a good question. Well, the name that immediately comes to mind is Bill Peters. Bill Peters was the director of, of Moby Dick, and he also did adaptations of uh, The Tempest he, uh, when he was at San Francisco, San Francisco State University, adaptations of The Possessed by Dostoevsky, uh, Memory of Fire by Galeano. And it's through him... Because so much of what I bring to audio drama, I taken from my theater days and I managed to find ways to adapt it to work within the medium. But one of the things that I learned from him was to kick the complacency out of theater. You know, okay, so here we have, we're, we're moving away from audio drama to theater, obviously, but, but there's a reason for that. Okay, so you have the audience is out here and the play is supposed to be up here. That's the way it's normally done. Well, why can't the play be in the audience and the audience be on stage? Why can't the play be over here, over here, over here, and over here, and you move the people around? It's the idea that theater does not have to conform to any one, one medium, any one style. And I really feel that way about audio drama as well. It doesn't have to conform to one, one thing or the other. You bring not just professionalism, but you're bringing some level of creativity the creative mind, my creative mind, I think was forged really in those San Francisco day to days. I think far more than high school. High school was, was freaking Oliver. High school was community theater. This is where I got my real education. And I really feel that if I hadn't have gotten what I got out of my San Francisco state days, I would not be doing what I'm doing right now, to be perfectly honest. And a lot of that I owe to Bill Peters. It's funny after Bill, Dufries, my business partner, died. I made sure to call Bill Peters. I hadn't spoken to him in like God, 20 years, I think. I made sure to call him to tell him that after all those years. So don't hold back or hold off on telling people how you feel about them. And he, was a, he was a very big part of my, uh, my artistic education. I don't want to say theatrical. I don't want to say audio. But my artistic education, if you want to talk about my audio education, that's really Bill DeFries, because I just learned a lot in the studio from working with him, but also how to work with actors, how to not settle for, okay, this is good enough, let's leave it here. No, is there another level that we can take it to? Let's try to take it there. It's two different bills. Bill Peters for the overall experience of being an actor and being an artist. Bill Dufries for what he gave me to be an audio dramatist, the proper term I use. From a professional standpoint, you've created many amazing audio dramas and worked with many amazing people, as you've mentioned yes! throughout this interview. So from a professional standpoint, you are a successful person. Do you consider yourself personally successful? No. <laughs> no. Because if you're personally successful, where is there left to go? You know, there's a, there's a great line I got from my Trinity rep days. That's where I went for my master of fine arts degree. And I think this is paramount for any artist to carry with them. And that's the words, there is no it to get. I've done it. I've made it. It has finally happened. Well, if you've done it, you've made it. It has finally happened. Where the hell are you going to go? Now, something very humbling when I was watching years ago um, inside the actor studio and finding out that Steven Spielberg still watches before he, I don't know if he still does it now, but he mentioned it at the time, there's four films that he always watches before he goes in to direct a film. One of which, I can't remember the other three, but I know one of them was The Searchers by John Ford, uh, because he's always learning something, you know? So am I successful? Success would mean that for me anyway, there's no place left to go. And I want to find as many other avenues and audio drama as humanly possible. I mean, I would love to be able to tackle this particular book 
I want to tackle this particular play. I want to tackle this particular true story. I want to tackle this, that, and the other thing and not uh, restrict myself to just one genre uh, as quite a few of my contemporaries have done. And that's perfectly fine for them. If, if that's what you know floats your boat, then by all means. Success? No, not at all. I mean, success on a monetary side, success in the way of being able to say, this is my day job, that would be, that would be, I guess, a successful thing. But being successful in terms of the material and what I've done so far, I don't see myself as successful at all. I see myself as a journeyman. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I don't have any. You pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, start all over again. It's that simple. I don't see anything that I've done so far as a failure in any way, shape, or form. I see everything as, again, going back to the idea of a learning experience. I don't have any hangups with the, with what I'm doing. No. La, 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 la. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an audio dramatist, whether it's as a writer, a creative person in some way, shape, or form, maybe you've inspired them down this path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Do good work and be generous. Be generous with your time. Be generous with your talent. And don't talk down to your audience. Just do really good work. Don't settle either. Don't settle for this is good enough. No, if you know it can be better, trust your instincts and make it even better. Because that's what's going to rise above the chaff is a work of quality where you're putting your 100% of yourself into it. And if that's not doable, then 110% or 120% if humanly possible. If your life was an audio drama, what would, its, <laughs> what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? It's a really interesting question. Just for a complete nonsensical title to fuck with people's heads, Mr. Axe Pizza is ready. And if I could afford him, I would get Paul Weller to do the soundtrack because Paul Weller is the man. There you go. He is the mod father. You know, we have to accept that reality. He is the mod father. He'll never reunite the jam, but he's still the mod father. Yeah. I do hate to say this, Lance, though, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much what? for coming on the show. <laughs> I was told there would be coffee and donuts as well. Uh, well, no. there's. I'm sure there's a no. Timmy's nearby your area, right? You just drive up to Vancouver or just down the road. I didn't say it was good coffee. Yeah, we have rocket donuts. Uh, oh, rocket donuts. Good, fancy. So, uh, johncarterrises.com. We have... Uh, shamans tears audio.com uh, if you go to bandcamp.com you can find london after midnight downloads are available of london after midnight as well as try this on for size we also have a limited edition vinyl set of london after midnight you can purchase vinyl records remember those yeah yeah we are making the the piece available as a vinyl album you can get the uh, the full full vinyl as well as some of the soundtrack but there's only 300 of those. When they're gone, they're gone for good. You can go to LondonAfterMidnight.com, uh, LondonAfterMidnight.co.uk. Uh, there we go. It'll direct you to the Bandcamp site where you can purchase a digital download. We have them available in binaural as well as Dolby Atmos. If you have Dolby Atmos headphones, you need to hear this thing. It's going to be absolutely spellbinding. London After Midnight available as vinyl record albums. And we also put together a book. And the bookie book contains the production script. It contains production diaries and a novella by my co-writer, Kenton Hall, which is quite amazing that he was able to do it in such a short period of time. You can purchase the, uh, the book there as well. We will be jumping into John Carter uh, fourth quarter of this year first quarter, hopefully on Shaman's Tears. Sign up for updates. That's the best way to uh, find out what's going on. I love it. That's awesome to hear. And Love it. Yep. I, can't, I can't wait to hear more about that uh, when the time comes for John Carter. I, I'm really excited about that for sure. Me too. Like Me I too. said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and 1,200 plus others since 2008. 1,200? Yeah. 
I've been at it a long while, unfortunately. Sometimes it feels like. <laughs> uh, TwoGeeksTalking.com. That's T-W-O, not the number two. That gets you to a completely different website you don't want to visit. Trust me, I know. Our YouTube channel is always updated. YouTube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back at TwoGeeksTalking.Podbean.com or just search TwoGeeksTalking wherever you get your podcast. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.